All right, so on page D2, we've spoken of monosaccharides and disaccharides. And now we want to speak about polysaccharides. Uh, now, the root poly means, and I actually wrote it there, many of you know it, it means many. Saccharide means sugars. So literally, a polysaccharide is just made up of many sugars joined together. Now, in fact, most polysaccharides, we wrote, are polymers of glucose. In other words, specifically, they are just long chains of a bunch of glucose molecules joined together. Now, these, the way these glucose molecules are snapped together can vary because they could be in a str long straight chain, they could be in branching chains or coils. <clears throat> and based upon how these glucose molecules are snapped together, uh, we have different types of polysaccharides. Now, we're going to give you three polysaccharides to know. Again, they're just like there were hundreds of monosaccharides and hundreds of disaccharides, and I just gave you a few examples of each. There are many, many types of polysaccharides. We're just giving you three examples. The three that we're going to talk about are starch, cellulose, and glycogen. Let's start with starch. Everybody's heard of starch. So when we say starch is a polysaccharide, we mean it's just made up of a whole bunch of glucose molecules joined together. Now, the scientific name for starch is amylose, which makes sense because we've learned that carbohydrates or sugars usually have that ending ose. Glucose, <coughs> sucrose, ribose, deoxyribose, <coughs> fructose. All right, so that's amylose is the true name for starch. Now, what is starch? Plants, we wrote, store glucose. Plants store glucose as starch. Let me remind you of how plants work. So plants, and many of you are taking lab, uh, in the leaves of plants, there are chloroplasts. We'll be learning about that in this class in much more detail as we go on. And so uh, uh, plants uh, use their leaves to manufacture sugars uh, using sunlight in a process known as photosynthesis. Photo means light. So they're using light to make sugars. And as the plant, bless you, as plants make sugars, then they join, and when I say sugars, I mean, I mean glucose. As they make glucose, they then join these glucose molecules together, many plants, into a storage form called starch or amylose. Now, <clears throat> so when we think of what foods are high in starch, the foods that come to mind that are high in starch are potatoes, rice, right, wheat. <coughs> You'd say, what do you mean wheat? Wheat's got starch. Yeah, we use wheat flour to make bread, which has starch, and pasta, which has starch, and uh, corn. Have you ever heard of corn starch? All right. So all of these are foods high in starch. So uh, notice that the only foods that contain starch or amylose are plants. There is no starch in animals. There's no starch in you. Okay? Your body does not contain starch. This is only found in plants. So it's simply the way many plants, not all plants, but many plants store sugars by joining them together in a polysaccharide called starch. Incidentally, do you think anything that I'm covering is in your book? Yeah. It's all in the book, chapter two. We're just tearing through the book. We're still in chapter two. Now, what is cellulose? Some of you have learned about cellulose already if you're taking lab, because uh, surrounding plant cells, surrounding the outside of plant cells is an outer rigid wall, a cell wall made up of this polysaccharide called cellulose. Now, animal cells, including human cells, do not have that outer cell wall. So there is no cellulose in anything from an animal. If you eat anything, any food from an animal, meat or fish or eggs, there is no cellulose. Just there's no starch either. So it's only found in something for plants. Now, what's uh, interesting about cellulose, which is made up of just a bunch of glucoses joined together, because of the way the glucoses are snapped together, we as humans cannot break that cellulose apart into individual glucose molecules. In other words, humans, we wrote, cannot digest cellulose. Since we cannot digest it, and therefore we cannot absorb it, 
Well, you'd say, what happens to it? It just goes through our digestive tract and comes out in our stool, in our feces. So uh, cellulose is often referred to as indigestible fiber or roughage. Now, our first thought is, well, if we can't even digest this stuff, and it's found surrounding all plant cells, who the hell needs it? But it actually appears that eating a certain amount of, of cellulose in our diet actually keeps our intestinal tract healthy. And I'll try to explain very briefly in what way eating something you can't digest keeps your digestive tract healthy. Let me give you first an example of how do you keep your arm muscles healthy. You have to make them work. You have to exercise. You have to make them exercise or work to keep your muscles healthy. All right? Same thing with your leg muscles. If you don't make them work, they become thin, they atrophy, they shrink, and they become weak. Well, your intestinal tract is muscular. It has muscle in the walls of your intestine that push food through your digestive tract. Cellulose, we cannot digest. So our digest, the muscular wall of our intestine actually has to push this stuff through our digestive tract to push it out of our body. That's not bad, because just like any other muscular activity, it keeps the mus muscular wall of the intestine strong and healthy. So we find that when people don't eat enough of this cellulose, this indigestible fiber in their diet, like any other muscle, the muscular wall of the intestine becomes thin and weak. And it creates various types of intestinal problems. Now, which type of foods contain cellulose? Well, it's got to be anything from a plant. The foods that are highest in cellulose would be whole grains. Whole grains. Whole wheat. Whole wheat bread or something like that. Uh, vegetables, celery, carrots, they, uh, they're from plants, they contain cellulose. Fruit has cellulose. But again, notice, the only things that I'm listing that have fiber or cellulose are from plants. There is no uh, cellulose in, uh, in anything from an animal. All right, so far we've given you two examples of polysaccharides. Both of them are found only in plants. Now we want to give you another example of a polysaccharide that is uniquely only found in animals. It's called glycogen. <coughs> now, this is an exception in, in, in to the rule that usually carbohydrates or sugars have that OSE OS ending. Glycogen does not have an OSE ending, but it is a carbohydrate. It's simply, what, what is glycogen? Glycogen is sometimes referred to as animal starch. It is, to, for animals, what starch is to plants. You'd say, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get you. What do you mean? What did we say the purpose of starch or amylose is? We said plants will join sugars together into this polysaccharide called starch. And they store it in the potato, in the corn, in the rice, and so on. Well, what many animals do, including us, is when we ingest foods with sugars, we store sugars by joining them together into a polysaccharide called glycogen. Now, where do the, are these sugars stored in our body as glycogen? We wrote that they are primarily stored as glycogen in your liver and muscles. In your liver and muscles. So we refer to this as liver glycogen and muscle glycogen. Now, I made a little note to see page J5. Because I want to make sure, I just mentioned that uh, the liver, your liver stores glycogen, and I just want to make sure everybody knows where your liver is. So if you look on page J5, on J5, you say, what page is this? J5. It was written right in there. So this is showing the human digestive system. And uh, this over here is the stomach, all right? And attached to the stomach are the intestines. The very first segment of the small intestine is called the duodenum. So I wrote the duodenum is the name for the beginning of the small intestine. All right, so the very beginning of the small intestine is called the duodenum. We'll have more to say about that. And uh, right up here is the largest organ in your body. It's called your liver. And the liver is really a giant biochemical factory.
that stores all kinds of nutrients. All kinds of nutrients are stored in your liver. <clears throat> and one of the nutrients that your liver stores is it stores sugars by joining them together into a polysaccharide called glycogen. All right, that's called liver glycogen. Incidentally, since I'm pointing to parts of the digestive system, you'll notice there's an organ located right here, right underneath the stomach, and that's the pancreas. And we'll talk more about the pancreas at another time. <clears throat> so we'll be learning about this. Anyhow, uh, the context that some of you have heard of storing glycogen in your liver is that some of you have heard that before long-distance runners, if you were going to run a marathon, if you're a long-distance marathon runner, for several days before the race, you will engage in something referred to as carbohydrate loading. You're going to eat a lot of carbs. What are carbs? Sugars. And you will store those sugars by joining them together into a polysaccharide called glycogen, and they will largely be stored in your liver and secondarily in your muscles. And that will provide a reserve supply of sugars for that running that very, very long race. All right, so that's called carbohydrate loading. Let's return back to page D2. So back on page D2, we've spoken of three examples of polysaccharides. All three of them are just made up of a whole bunch of glucose molecules joined together, but they're joined together in three slightly different ways. Starch or amylose is the way plants store sugars, many plants. Cellulose is a polysaccharide for, uh, forming the outer cell wall of all plant cells. And glycogen is the way animals, including humans, store sugars, primarily in their liver and muscles. Okay, now that we've completed our description of three categories of carbohydrates, now we're going to talk about lipids. Lipids are fats. We know that lipid means fat because we've heard the word liposuction. Now, what are the characteristics of lipids or fats? Fats or lipids are mostly just made up of long chains of carbon atoms with a bunch of hydrogens attached to them. Another characteristic of fats is they're not soluble in water. They will not dissolve or mix with water. An example of a fat is vegetable oil. If you take vegetable oil and water and you mix them together, they just separate apart. All right, The vegetable oil will float on top of the water. Furthermore, we did write that lipids can be synthesized from sugars in cells. You'd say, what do you mean? All that we're saying is that sugars can be turned into fats. You'd say, I didn't know that. Yes, you did. If you eat a whole lot of sugar, you may become fat. All right, so sugars can be turned into fats. Also, we wrote that sh uh, fats, number four, contain more stored energy than any other type of organic compounds. Now, the way that we measure energy, the way that we measure the amount of energy in foods is using a unit called calories, calories of energy. So what we're saying is that fats contain more calories or calories of energy than any other type of food. More than carbs, more than proteins, really they are very concentrated forms of energy. Now, just as there were different types of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides, there are different types of fats or lipids. The simplest of the fats are called fatty acids. And we divide the fatty acids into what are called saturated fatty acids, or people just call them saturated fats, and unsaturated fatty acids, or unsaturated fats. Now, obviously, I've created a chart here. But before we look at the chart, let's look at page D10 and see on page D10 what do fatty acids actually look like. Okay, this is the top of page D10. And first off, what this shows actually at the top right is starch, right? A polysaccharide. These are just a bunch of glucose molecules joined together. All right, that's a starch. It's a polysaccharide. Now, pictured here in the filling up most of the middle of the page are three fatty acids. Right? There are three fatty acids. There's the top one, the middle, and the bottom. 
And the first thing that strikes us about fatty acids is that it doesn't matter which of these three you look at, they're basically long chains of carbon atoms with a bunch of hydrogen atoms attached. Incidentally, we know that we had learned for this most recent exam, we had talked about methane and ethane and propane and butane and even octane. And we had said that octane, which is found in gasoline, that provides energy, that's the chemical that's actually in gasoline that provides energy for your car, octane was how many carbon atoms long if it was octa? Eight. Octa means eight. Well, these fatty acids are much longer numbers of carbon atoms long than even octane. This particular one is 18, you don't have to know this, 18 carbon atoms long. You'd say, so what does that mean? It means that it's actually got uh, uh, basically uh, 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 three times, actually if, if octane has got eight carbons, so this has got 18, this has got far more energy or calories of energy in it than does octane in gasoline. Because the longer this chain of carbon atoms, the more calories of energy it contains. So this is just really concentrated energy. Let me give you a sense of when I say concentrated energy. If you want to burn fat, let's say you want to lose some fat from your body. To get rid of, to get rid of one pound of fat, you have to burn uh, 3,500 calories. So if you've ever been on a treadmill, sweating, and you've run three more miles, four miles, and you've burned 300 calories, you have to burn 3,500 calories to burn one pound of fat. That's how much energy it contains, all right? One pound of fat will allow you to run however many miles that is. Uh, so very high. Now the only thing about this molecule that's not just a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached is that at one end it's got a double bonded oxygen and an OH. This is known as an acid group and thus the name fatty acid. <clears throat> now that's, this particular fatty acid is called a saturated fatty acid. You'll notice that surrounding uh, all, every carbon atom each carbon atom has two hydrogens attached to it. It's fully saturated or loaded up. Remember, every carbon atom has to have a total of four lines coming off it. And it's sharing some electrons with it carbons next to it. Now, in the middle fat, fatty acid, in the middle fatty acid, you'll notice that right here, where I put the arrows, it's got a double covalent bond. All right, that just means that these carbons are sharing not one, but two electrons with each other. Because we know there's that rule that each carbon has only four lines coming off it to represent the four electrons that it shares, so therefore this is missing two hydrogen atoms, isn't it? It's got two less hydrogen atoms than this fatty acid above it. So it's not fully loaded up. It's not fully saturated with hydrogens, is it? So it's called an unsaturated fatty acid, or a monounsaturated. Now in the third fatty acid, you'll notice that in more than one place, it's got double covalent bonds. And therefore, in more than one place, it's missing hydrogens, isn't it? All right? This is called a polyunsaturated fatty acid, because in more than one place, it's missing hydrogens. Now your, our first thought is, OK, so what? So what if it's saturated fat, unsaturated fat, or a polyunsaturated fat? So what we're going to see right now is that the less saturated it is, the less calories of energy. All right? Because actually, the carbon-hydrogen bonds, when they're broken, they release a lot of energy. So the fewer carbon-hydrogen bonds there are, when this molecule, this fat, is broken apart to release energy, it releases less calories of energy. But let's see where I actually wrote this. Let's go back to page, uh, back to page D2. So back on page D2, this is page D2, so we made a chart. You said, well, give me a chance to copy it down. We're going to give you plenty of chance to copy it down. All right, so what we've done in this chart on page D2 
is to compare and contrast saturated fats with unsaturated. And we've shown you pictures of it. Let's first talk about saturated fats, then we'll look at the unsaturated. All right? So under saturated fats, what are the characteristics? Saturated fats contain more carbon-hydrogen bonds. Right? The definition of unsaturated is that they're missing hydrogens. Having more carbon-hydrogen bonds means they contain more calories of energy. Because when those carbon-hydrogen bonds are broken, they release energy. Interestingly, saturated fats are generally solid at room temperature. You'd say, what does that mean? I'm going to show you in a minute, moment. Saturated fats are the fats found in animals, including us. So there are, most, we mostly have saturated fats in our body. And when we eat anything from an animal, meat or uh, uh, eggs and so on, milk, it tends to can be high in saturated fats. What are some examples of common fats that you've heard of that contain mostly saturated fats? Butter. Butter is from an animal, right? From a cow. Right? It's made from the milk of a cow. It's from an animal. Is butter solid at room temperature? Yes, it is. Okay, lard. Lard is pig fat. All right, so is that from an animal? Yes. Is it solid at room temperature? Yes, it is. These are all high in saturated fats. Now, a fifth thing that we wrote is that when we eat saturated fats and cholesterol, which is something that I'll be explaining yet, that increases your risk of cardiovascular diseases. So increased consumption of saturated fats and cholesterol increases your risk of cardiovascular or heart disease. And an example, an example of that is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is really when there's simply a buildup of saturated fats and cholesterol in the inner walls of our arteries. So when we eat a lot of saturated fats and cholesterol, it clogs up our arteries. This clogging up of our arteries increases our risk of strokes and heart attacks. What's a stroke? What's a heart attack? A stroke or a heart attack is when these clogged up arteries, if, if the arteries are clogged up carrying blood to our brain, that means our brain might not be getting enough oxygenated blood, and if it doesn't get enough oxygenated blood, that's called a stroke. Part of your brain dies. If your heart is, is, if the arteries supplying your heart are all clogged up with saturated fats and cholesterol, that means your heart won't be getting enough oxygenated blood, and that leads to what's called a heart attack. So both heart attacks, where part of the heart dies, and strokes, where part of the brain dies, are both due to a clogging up of the arteries with saturated fats and cholesterol. These are the leading causes of death. All right, so it sounds like we want to try to avoid eating foods high in saturated fats and cholesterol. What do you think? All right, now, what about unsaturated fats? Unsaturated fats contain less carbon-hydrogen bonds. Right? We showed pictures of it. They were missing hydrogen atoms. They were not fully saturated with hydrogen. If they ha and they, uh, having fewer carbon-hydrogen bonds, that means they contain less calories of energy. So one immediate advantage of unsaturated fats is that they're lower in calories of energy, right? If you're trying to reduce the calorie intake. Unsaturated fats are generally liquid at room temperature. The term that we give to a, a liquid fat is an oil. We call liquid fats oils. These oils or liquid fats are primarily found in plants. We obtain them from plants. So what are some examples? What are some examples of fats or oils that you've heard of that are primarily contain unsaturated fats and are from plants? Olive oil, peanut oil, safflower oil, sesame seed oil. These are all, right, fats from plants. Largely they are unsaturated fats, and that means they have fewer calories of energy, and they also have another advantage they do not increase our risk of cardiovascular disease. They do not increase the risk of atherosclerosis, strokes, and heart attacks. All right, let's take a look at uh, what's shown right below. So there's a chart here 
And what it, the chart shows is it shows some common fats and analyzes these common fats as far as what percent of the fats or fatty acids in these fats are saturated and what percent are unsaturated. So I just drew arrows but next to two of them just to compare. So corn oil, when we chemically analyze corn oil, 13% of the fats in corn oil are saturated but by far the majority, 87% of the fats in corn oil are unsaturated fats. All right, so we're not saying that plant uh, oils or plant fats have no saturated fats, but they are very relatively low. Now, in contrast, look at butter. All right, butter is from a cow, an animal. You'll notice that the majority, 66% of the fats found in butter are saturated fats. All right? So while it does have some unsaturated fats, it's overwhelmingly mostly saturated. So you can see clearly, in general, the fats from plants are generally unsaturated. The fats from animals are generally higher in saturated fats. There is an exception, however. Palm kernel oil and coconut oil, which are obviously from plants, palm trees and coconut trees, when we chemically analyze coconut oil and palm kernel oil, they actually are very high in saturated fats. Uh, they, because palm trees and coconut trees are usually found indigenous, living in tropical places on the planet, these fat oils from these, uh, uh, from these uh, plants are commonly called tropical oils. Now what's interesting is that people, we as people, we like the taste of animal fats. We like the taste of saturated fats. We like butter. One of the things that we like about meat is the saturated fats in meat. They taste good, right? We just like that. And we prefer the taste of animal fats than vegetable oils or plant fats. <clears throat> now what's interesting is because the coconut oil, for example, is so high in saturated fats, they will commonly use coconut oil as a substitute for a animal fats. So an example is that if you get non-dairy creamer, mocha mix, non-dairy creamer, so instead of using cream from a cow, which is like butter, so non-dairy non creamer like mocha mix is made using coconut oil. So because it's high in saturated fats, so it can, it can lend that flavor that we like of cream, you know, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> however, that, that, that does mean that these are not necessarily any healthier than the, than the animal fats. Uh, they do have some advantages, as we'll see. Uh, using non-dairy creamer or non-dairy ice cream, uh, they do not have cholesterol. There is cholesterol in anything from an animal. These are from plants, so there's no cholesterol in it, but they are high in saturated fats. They also have another advantage that if you're lactose intolerant, uh, and I think we've mentioned that before, did we not? Mm -hmm. All right, well, we will. Anyhow, if you're lactose intolerant, that means you can't digest the sugar in milk, lactose. <clears throat> and so uh, if you drink, uh, if you have uh, uh, milk, it's got lactose in it or any dairy product. If you use non-dairy creamer, it doesn't have lactose, so you don't have to worry about being lactose intolerant. Now, uh, another thing I want to point out, let's again look on page D10. Let's look on D10 one more time. And again on page D10, on page D10, so on page D10, uh, we have been saying that saturated fats are the found kind found mostly in animals. They are higher in calories. They increase our risk of, of cardiovascular disease. But we do tend to like the flavor of these saturated fats. Uh, uh, unsaturated fats are the fats generally found from plants. These vegetable oils, they are lower in calories and they don't increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases. But we want to explain that what another thing uh, food companies do is be, uh, they will can take, they can take vegetable oils made out of unsaturated fats and they can attach hydrogen atoms onto these unsaturated fats. 
And by attaching hydrogen atoms onto it, that makes it then chemically look like a saturated fat. Does everybody follow that? What do we call it when they, companies take an a, 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 a unsaturated oil, a fatty acid or oil, and add hydrogen atoms onto it, so now it looks and tastes like an animal fat, a saturated animal fat? These are called hydrogenated vegetable oils. Have you ever seen that term? Yeah. So a hydrogenated vegetable oil, and they're also known as trans fatty acids, is when they attach hydrogen atoms onto a vegetable oil, an unsaturated fat, making it look and taste like a saturated fat from an animal. Now I know your first thought is, why are they doing this? Originally, the first reason why they did this is they were able to take like vegetable oil, like corn oil, they hydrogenated it, and they called it margarine. What's margarine? Margarine is something made from vegetable oils that looks and tastes like butter. So how did they make something look and taste like butter? They took something that was made up of unsaturated fatty acids from plant, vegetable oils, and they hydrogenated it, so now it looks like the saturated fats in butter. Incidentally, that makes it at least as bad as butter. And some people would argue that it's worse because it's totally synthetic and not natural. At least if you eat butter, at least it's natural. This is totally chemically made. But we see the use of hydrogenated vegetable oils everywhere. Let's show you what we mean by looking at page. Let's take a look at uh, page uh, D17. On D17, so this is page D17. And we're going to look at D17 for a few things here. Now, all that I did on page D17 is I took some labels off uh, various foods. So first, let's just look at this one on the lower left on D17. On the lower left, this is page D17. This is the label from Mazzola brand margarine. So let's just see. What I'm trying to, obviously, what I'm trying to show you is I want us to take our knowledge of biological chemistry and understand food labels and understand the chemicals that are in them. So when you look at any food label, this is required by the federal government. It's interesting, the federal government requires all this labeling, but most people, A, don't read it, and B, even if they tried, wouldn't understand it. So they require it, and sometimes it basically ticks off the companies that they have to write it down, and, but no, and nobody's reading it anyhow, but anyhow. Uh, they always indicate serving size. So in this case, a serving size is one tablespoon of margarine. And they will indicate how many calories per serving. 100 calories in this case per tablespoon of Mazzola brand margarine. All right. Now, how much protein is in Mazzola brand margarine? What's it show? Zero. Zero. How much carbs? Zero. It's pure fat. It's pure fat. Look at that. The only, everything is zero except for fat. Now, it does have zero cholesterol because it is made from plants, and cholesterol, as we will be learning, is found only in stuff, uh, food from animals. Uh, let's look down under ingredients. So under ingredients, how do you make this Mazzola brand margarine? It's made from corn oil, and here's the word, partially hydrogenated corn oil. They add hydrogen atoms, changing it from an unsaturated fat to a saturated fat. That makes it become solid. It changes from being a liquid vegetable oil to a solid. Now it tastes more like butter, it looks like butter, and it's just as bad for you as butter, probably worse. Let's just look at another example. Right above this, certainly one of my favorites, Rich's Chocolate Eclairs. I can go for that right now. <laughs> Let's see what's in Rich's Chocolate Eclairs. So you'll notice it's got corn syrup. Uh, corn syrup is actually another name for glucose. So anytime you ever see corn syrup, that's just glucose from corn, right? And uh, then it's got water. It's got vegetable shortening. If you didn't know what the word shortening means, shortening means fat, all right? And so what is this vegetable fat made from? A blend of hydrogenated palm kernel oil 
and partially hydrogenated soybean cottonseed or palm oil. You'll notice, in other words, they're just throwing hydrogenated vegetable oils all over the place. Now again, you might say, well, why are they doing that? I want to repeat to you, humans like the taste of animal fats or saturated fats better than vegetable fats. So we like the taste of butter better than we like the taste of corn oil. All right? That's why on a piece of bread, you like, people like to spread butter or something that looks and tastes like butter, margarine, but we like that better than putting, you know, vegetable oil on it. In fact, in Italy, they don't use butter or margarine. They dip their bread in olive oil, right, that's flavored with garlic and, and oregano and so on. And that's actually, if you're going to put fat on bread, that's actually much healthier to put vegetable oil on if you're going to put fat than to put anything that's saturated fats, whether it's animal fats or something with, that's been made to look and resemble animal fats. All right, but we just like the taste of animal fats. That's just the way it is. All right, so it's got a bunch of other stuff in here as well. Let's, since we're looking at this, let's just look on the flip side. And on the flip side, uh, this is showing on uh, page D18. This is uh, the side panel from Duncan Hines Yellow Cake Mix. Let's just take a look at it. And we're just trying to learn how to read these things. Again, they always indicate the serving size and the calories and the protein and the carbohydrate and fat level. I know it's a little bit hard to make out, but let's just focus on ingredients. So you'll notice under ingredients, it says it's got sugar and dextrose. Sugar, when they say sugar, they mean sucrose. You know, CNA sugar from Hawaii. That's the regular sugar. Dextrose is another name for glucose. All right, so they, glucose is also called corn sugar or dextrose. In fact, in a hospital setting, and I showed this in my lab, in a hospital setting, dextrose is the most common sugar that they give in a hospital setting. What is dextrose? It's glucose. Uh, you'll also notice it says it's got enriched bleached flour. You know what they actually do to create enriched bleached flour? They first refine flour and remove all the nutrients, and then they throw in some vitamins. Okay, so bleached means they make it look white, and they remove all the nutrients, and then they add, it's enriched, so they throw in some vitamins. But then it says vegetable shortening. What did we tell you vegetable shortening means? Fat, all right? And here you can see hydrogenated soybean oil. So in almost everything we look at has hydrogenated vegetable oils, okay? Because, why? Because people like the taste of them, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the, um, all right, that's a, we're going to look at more labels as we go on, but let's go back to page, <clears throat> back to page actually D3 this time. So on page D3, We might ask the following question on D3. On D3, do we even need fats in our diet? We do need fats, but the only fats that are considered essential or necessary are unsaturated fats. So the only fats that are essential are unsaturated. We do not need any saturated fats at all. And obviously, excessive consumption of saturated fats and cholesterol are the source of most uh, 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 major medical problems that we find in modern society. <clears throat> all right, and which, uh, which foods contain unsaturated fats? Does meat have unsaturated fats? Does eggs have unsaturated fats? So which foods? Plants. Those are the only fats that we need are those fats from plants, whether it's from grains or vegetables or fruits. Now, on the one hand, you could, refer, you could say what I'm covering right now, which is in chapter two, you could call it biochemistry. You could also call it nutrition, because all we're doing is learning what's in our food and what it is that we need. All right, now, another type of fat, one that you probably have not heard of before, are called prostaglandins. 
Now, prostaglandins get their name, you don't have to know this, but they got their name because they were first identified in the prostate gland of men. That has nothing to do with their function. That's just how they got their name. That was the first place they discovered them. Now, before we tell you what prostaglandins are, what they're for, these fats, let's just see a picture of them. So we wrote, see page D10. So let's take a look at page D10. We've been there before. And on page D10, pictured right below, right below the fatty acids, is a prostaglandin. All right, now looking at the prostaglandin, that's this, it's basically, what should impress you is it looks like it's basically two chains of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached. All right, it's just two long chains of carbons with hydrogens attached. Those are really just two fatty acids. And then they're kind of linked together, looped together on the left-hand side. All right, so they basically kind of look like these things. These guys just accept there's two of them and they're looped together on, on one side. Okay, now that we've described what they look like, what are they for? So back on page D3, what are the purpose of prostaglandins? So, I drew an arrow here, it's a little bit messy. So prostaglandins, what are they? I drew a cell. This could be any cell in your body. When a cell is injured, when cells are injured, they release these prostaglandin fats out of the cell membrane. So these prostaglandins are released from the cell membrane of injured cells. You'd say, okay, so what? What, are prostag what do those fats do? When they are released from the cell membrane of injured cells, they cause inflammation. They cause inflammation. You'd say, what's inflammation? Inflammation is defined as redness, warmth, swelling, and pain. So anytime we see redness, warmth, swelling, and pain, we say it's inflamed. And the clinical term that's used is we put that suffix ending itis. So we could have, you know, tonsillitis, pharyngitis, uh, myositis, you know, anything, bronchitis. All right? It just means it's inflamed. So uh, let me explain what's the, uh, uh, give you two quick examples of what I've just, uh, just described. Let's imagine that I was hammering a nail, and I missed the nail and slammed the hammer right into my thumb. Have I injured cells? Yes. They start to release these chemicals, and within a matter of moments, my thumb is all inflamed. It's all red, warm, swollen, and hurts like hell. That's caused by these prostaglandins. Let me give you a second example. A second example. You've got a strep throat. What's a strep throat? You've got a bacterial infection in your throat. It's actually called a streptococcus bacteria. So that bacteria is feeding on your throat. It's a living thing. It's a parasite. And it's feeding on your cells of your throat. So it, as these bacteria feed on your throat, is it injuring your cells? Yes. So as when you've got this sore throat, you've got a bacteria injuring your cells, the injured cells release these chemicals, and next thing you know, your throat is all inflamed. It's red, it's warm, it's swollen, and it hurts like hell. Now, interestingly, we can now tell you how these drugs work. Aspirin and Advil and Motrin are known as anti-inflammatory drugs. So how do they work? is they actually stop the injured cells from releasing prostaglandins. And but these drugs, by stopping the release of prostaglandins, reduce the inflammation. They reduce the redness, the warmth, the swelling, and the pain. So that's how they work. They're called anti-inflammatory drugs. All right, so now you know how they work. So prostaglandins are a type of fat released from uh, the cell membranes of injured cells. All right, another type of fat are monoglycerides, diglycerides, and triglycerides. 
<clears throat> now, what are they? Uh, I drew a picture right here. We're going to show you a more detailed picture in a moment. All right, now, this is a three carbon molecule that's called glycerol. Glycerol is three carbon atoms. If one fatty acid, if a one fatty acid were attached to this glycerol, it would be called a monoglyceride. You say, say that, spell that out. It's written right here. Monoglyceride. If this glycerol had two fatty acids attached, it's called a diglyceride. Di means two. If the glycerol has three fatty acids attached, it's called a triglyceride. And in fact, we've got all of these fats in our body, monoglycerides, diglycerides, and triglycerides. When they analyze your blood, they measure not only uh, uh, monoglyceride or fatty acid levels, triglyceride levels, cholesterol levels, all these different fats. It's actually known as a lipid panel when they analyze it. Now, why do we care about them? When we say that fat cells store fats, the way that fat cells store fats is as triglycerides. In other words, Inside of a fat cell, it takes three fatty acids and <laughs> attaches three fatty acids onto glycerol to form a triglyceride, and that's what's stored inside of our fat cells. Now, this is reversible. So our fat cells, when we eat a lot of fat or fatty acids, the fatty acids are attached to glycerol and stored in a fat cell as triglycerides. On the other hand, when we're burning fat for energy, we break apart the triglyceride back into fatty acids and glycerol, separate it apart, and then use it for a source of energy. All right, so that's what triglycerides are. And you can have, just like you can have high, uh, very high levels of, of cholesterol, which are not good, and you can have high levels of saturated fatty acids, you can also have high levels of triglycerides. And that's, doctors will go and analyze all that. Okay, now another type of lipid are phospholipids. Some of you have already heard about this in lab. So a phospholipid, phospholipids are important because they make up uh, the membranes of cells. Now let's look at some pictures. Let's take a look at page D11. D11. And actually, uh, actually, just before we look at D11, let's look at the bottom of D10. This is the bottom of D10. So you'd say, what are we looking at here? Again, I want to remind you, all of this is in your book. It really is. Chapter 2. We're just tearing through the book at an amazing speed. We're in Chapter 2. All right, so this is the more detailed structure where it shows monodi and triglycerides. All right, this is glycerol. Certainly, you'd say, well, like, do I have to memorize that? You don't have to write anything on a test. It's all multiple choice questions. All right, it's a three carbon molecule. And here it shows a fatty acid. And you might say, I don't get that. How could that be a fatty acid? If you look carefully, what they did is they wrote CH214. Everybody see that? And you'd say, I don't, yeah, what does that mean? That means that they, if you took carbon with two hydrogens, everybody see what I'm pointing to? Carbon with two hydrogens, that's CH2. And you did that 14 times. Wouldn't that form a long fatty acid? Mm -hmm. So that was just a shorthand way. Instead of drawing out 14 carbon atoms in a line with hydrogens attached, they just for short wrote CH2 14 times. So, it's showing how this fatty acid is attached to glycerol. Now, we saw that on one end of a fatty acid is a double bonded oxygen and an OH. This is known as the acid group. Now, how is a fatty acid attached to this glycerol molecule? Notice that a hydrogen atom is removed from one of them. 
I don't, you don't have to know which one, but a hydrogen is re being removed from one of these, and an OH is being removed from the other. In this picture, the hydrogen's coming from glycerol, the OH is coming from the fatty acid. I don't care that you know which one gives what. When you combine an H and an OH, what does that form? H2O. Can you see over here, it shows H2O forming. And where that H and OH used to be, after they're removed, that's where the fatty acid attaches to the glycerol. What do we call that kind of reaction? A dehydration synthesis reaction. We are joining together synthesis, how? By removing water. This is the common way that organic molecules are snapped together, by removing water. You'd say, are we going to see this some more in the future? Yeah. Yes, it's going to keep reappearing. You'd say, well, like, you didn't really cover it. Actually, dehydration synthesis, you needed to know for this most recent test. We covered it on D1. So if you attach one fatty acid to glycerol, that's called a monoglyceride. If you attach a second fatty acid onto glycerol, that's called a diglyceride. And if you have a third fatty acid attached to it, it's called a triglyceride. And it, you'll form three waters. Now, this is reversible. So once you've got a triglyceride, which is shown here, you can break it back apart into glycerol and three separate fatty acids by adding water. That's called a hydrolysis reaction. Let's look on D11. And on D11, all right, you say, what a mess. Right, so let's figure out what we're doing here. All right, what I drew right here is a simplified diagram of a triglyceride. You'd say, what? I'm just looking at this part right here. Here's the three carbon glycerol. Here's the three fatty acids attached to it. All right, that's called a triglyceride. And it's labeled that. We, now, this is the third time we're talking about it. All right, so a, a, a triglyceride is a glycerol with three fatty acids attached. Why is it important? Because that's how fats are stored in our fat cells. Incidentally, how are sugars stored in our liver and muscle cells? How are sugars stored in our liver and muscle cells? As glycogen. That's how sugars are stored in our liver cells and muscle cells, as glycogen. We talked about that earlier today. Now, what is a phospholipid? A phospholipid looks actually quite similar to a triglyceride. You'd say, what do you mean? Here is the three carbon glycerol. One, two, three. Just like glycerol here, one, two, three. And just like in a triglyceride, there's a fatty acid attached to the top carbon. And just like triglyceride, there's a second fatty acid attached to the second carbon. So far, it looks identical. So where is the difference? In a triglyceride, there's a third fatty acid. In a phospholipid, instead of a third fatty acid, there's a phosphate group. A phosphate group. Phosphate is phosphorus and four oxygens. That's called a phosphate group. Now, a phospholipid molecule is schizophrenic. You'd say it's who? It's got a split personality. You'd say, what do you mean? Normally, do fats mix with water? No. 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 <clears throat> so these fats, as it says, are hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means they hate water. Hydro is water. Phobic means they hate. But the phosphate group is hydrophilic. Hydro is water, and philic means it likes. So it likes water. So the last comment for today, and we'll pick this up uh, on Wednesday, is that a phospholipid molecule is commonly represented by a balloon and two strings attached to it. The balloon part represents where the phosphate is that's hydrophilic. And the two strings represent the two fatty acid chains that are hydrophobic. All of this is in chapter